Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to MCN, another session from the MCN 2021. My name is Giles. Um, we are at the first of two sessions today, the, both on the notion and around um, hybrid museums. Uh, this is panel one of two, and panel two of two will start 15 minutes after this one. Uh, this session is co-chaired by myself, Charles Pooley, and Toril Haugen from the Sörlandets Kunstmuseum in Norway. And we'll just let a few people come on in, and uh, then we'll get started. Um, to get us going, we thought it'd be nice to find out where you all are today. So please let us know in the chat where you guys are all uh dialing in, zooming in from. Uh, I'm currently, this is a very international talk today. Uh, I'm currently in Barcelona. We've got people in New York. We've got people in Norway. We've got people in Copenhagen on our panel. So it's, uh, it's an international one and we'd love to know where you guys are. Um, just let us know and then we'll get started in just a second. Okay, so let's get going, right? Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. I always think that's a nice one. Um, please do let, as I said, please let us know where you're joining us from. We'll come back to see who, where you are later on. We're very glad to have you with us. Um, as I've said already, this is the first of two sessions. Uh, this session is gonna be about 45 minutes long, but it is gonna be 45 minutes long because we've got a hard out. Um, I'll do introductions in a second. Uh, but with this session is an open discussion around the notion of what is a hybrid museum or a hybrid museum experience. Um, and at the end of the open discussion, there will be a Q&A, so you will get a chance to feed some questions to the panelists. Um, and what else? And then, and yes, and then following immediately after this is a second session in this series in which my co-chair Toril Haugen from the Sundalands um, Museum in Norway will be doing a deep dive into SKMU, a virtual experience and a virtual digital twin of their museum. But uh, she'll be joined on that call by other participants in the, in the project, um, Luminart and Genetic Camus. I'm trying to get through this quite quickly because uh, we've got quite a lot to discuss and I'm just very conscious that it's only 45 minutes. So apologies if I'm going too fast for people. And actually that is a good point. I will slow down a bit, right? Um, so today, we, as I said, we're talking about, um, so first of all, my name is Giles Pooley. Uh, I am a digital producer and former director of design for in Antenna International. Um, but for the last four years, I've been working as a freelancer and have set up a collective called Lucid Lab. Um, we are a digital collective of strategic creatives and we help with delivering digital transformation and immersive experiences. So that's me. I am middle-aged, mixed race, gay. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, and I'm in Barcelona and what you can see behind me, if it's still working, because I can't see it on Zoom, is an image of a virtual gallery that we've created in which we are hosting um, ongoing calendar of rotating art exhibitions by digital artists. Um, and so now into the talk. Uh, we are looking at hybrid museums and museum experiences. And I found this definition earlier on in one of the conference talks, um, and they refer to hybrid museums as museum programs, content, or other experiences designed to engage audiences both on site and online synchronously and asynchronously or asynchronously. Um, I think that's a great definition. But I think we in our talk today are potentially going to open that up. Um, and I think you'll see why when we get into the examples that some of our guest speakers are sharing with us. And talking about guest speakers, joining today, we have um, a wonderful panel of talkers. Um, first of all, we've got Sophie Anderson, who as a creative director, Sophie develops digital content and strategy. And she also leads interdisciplinary teams um, at and helps museums you reach new audiences for the Metropolitan Museum. Um, she currently heads up the digital content and editorial teams, and she's currently working on bringing art and new perspectives to audiences wherever they are. 
We then have Nina Colosi, who is the founder and creative director of the Streaming Museum, a program of the arts and world affairs for the public. Also, we are joined by Merit Sandhoff, Sanderhoff, the curator and senior advisor of the museum practice at SMK, the National Gallery of Denmark, where she is responsible for the museum's open access policy that aims to foster active reuse of the digitized collections. And last, but definitely not least, is, and I'm so worried I'm going to say this name wrong, Michal Chudnarak, oh, I, I, I did get that wrong, the head of digital collections and services at the Slovak National Gallery. Um, Michal has been at the Slovak National Gallery for more than a decade, where he took an active role in transitioning the gallery uh, into the digital, digital realm, um, from cataloging through to digitization. He's also a member of lab.sng, uh, the R&D team at the uh, Slovak National Gallery, where he's currently working on concepts for digital and immersive experiences. Um, my co-chair today is Toril Haugen, who is also digital advisor and uh, curator for the Kunstmuseum in Kristenstand, um, Norway, and the new, newly to be currently being renovated and to be opened in 2024, the Sordlands Kunstseiler, a new space. So what I'd like to do now is I'm going to ask... Guys, we also have, yeah. we have Nina with us. Just I said Nina. Did I not say Nina? Yeah, Nina, yes, you I'm did. So <laughs> you, did, you did say. Oh, thank you, Nina. <laughs> yes, you. of course you did. Um, okay, I would have, I would have put it down now. <laughs> thank, you, <laughs> thank you, Toril. Thank you, Toril. We, I'd like to um, open this up, uh, and I'm going to do this alphabetically. So, I apologies to Sophie because she comes with the surname Anderson, but um, I'm going to ask um, each one of our wonderful guests to give us a quick two minute uh, to two to three minute explanation on what they think of when, when they think of the term uh, hybrid museum experience, including some of the examples that they've kindly shared. So Sophie, over to you and I'll man the, uh, the slides. Thanks, Giles. Um, thanks for inviting me to be part of this discussion. And it's great to be here with these um, co-panelists and to all of you out there virtually. I wish uh, we could actually see each other. Um, but um, so as Giles very kindly introduced, I'm uh, heading up the digital content and editorial team at the Met. And when Giles asked me to think about this question about being hybrid, I thought, well, we've always really been hybrid, right? Thinking about um, digital and physical experiences, tracking from the physical on site, tracking to um, from the digital to the on site. But I think everyone now is really much more aware of what's possible and thinking about um, the digital as not just a simulation um, of our on site experiences, really thinking about it as the experience and not comparing our value um, of a digital experience to the physical. Um, but I think more pointedly, we should be asking kind of what's the role of, of our museums and digital as part of that. Um, I'm not just thinking about you know, hybrid as either physical or digital, but really about thinking about outside the museum walls. Um, digital helps us to do that, but there are so many ways in which we should be thinking about hybrid um, and really connecting, um, as Giles was saying, where people are. Um, I also think it's about how we present um, history or art or cultural heritage using all of the assets that we spend so much time getting online, whether it's a single artwork or a video, using the story, the context, um, thinking about the relevance and for our audiences to um, uh, for the for the content, but also in ways that they can co-create with the content. So, you know, thinking beyond just access, um, we have so much stuff online. We have so much to wade through online as consumers um, and um, thinking about kind of changing that dichotomy into more of a participatory experience and less about um, us as museums of authority, but more about us as conveners of meaning. Um, so I, I shared some quick examples and I wanna go quickly just cause we've got a lot to get through. Um, I shared Met Stories, which is really on the face of it, a video series, but essentially it was supposed to be kind of a nice to have during our 150th um, anniversary. And of course, because of the pandemic, so much of what was um, planned to be physical didn't happen. And so this series really became a very, very big component of our 150th. And through it, we really learned that um, we can be a less austere museum for our audiences through um, this kind of 
online experience, maybe even more so than if they had come to some of the on-site um, celebrations. So these are first person lived experience stories is, um, about the impact of, of uh, the Met and art um, specifically. Uh, moving on to my next example, um, we pivoted a lot in our audio program during the pandemic, really thinking about how to reach people who potentially weren't coming to the museum, but also reaching people who were coming to the museum. So we went from, you know, traditional audio guide structures of individual stops per artwork to more of a hybrid podcast approach where we really were telling more chapter stories that people could listen to while they were on site or they could listen to from home. So again, just kind of innovating within um, some of our kind of usual uh, practices. Um, but moving on, I think one of the, the projects we got most excited about was our Animal Crossing activation. So this was taking our, um, our open access program and our API and integrating it with Animal Crossing, uh, which is a, a video game platform, very popular. Um, and what we saw there was um, just a huge interest in people being able to integrate art into their own world, right? And I think we've many of us played around with virtual environments for art. This is really about art in people's own virtual environments rather than coming to one that we've created and what got us so excited was just seeing that um, you know so many people um, were activating um, these artworks and you know particularly drawing a huge audience from Japan which was um, you know very interesting to us. Um, we were also engaged with um, AR activations that were creating virtual worlds, our Unframed series, I don't have an image of it here, uh, was a partnership with Verizon where we created 13 imaginary rooms of our own, uh, where we invited people to come through in, in just a month. Um, that was super exciting from just kind of a technology perspective and, and the stories that we were able to tell there. Um, but this is really kind of, I think, that long tail of open access and really being able to bring it to people where they are. Um, my next example is more in the education sector. So we've partnered with Microsoft on their Flipgrid environment, and they um, we have now about 120 plus topics within Flipgrid where um, kids can use our content to make their own videos and uh, teachers can use it to create prompts for their lesson plans. So again, I think really thinking about being outside of our own um, networked experience of the, of the Mets channels and reaching people on their own. And then my last example is the Louisiana channel, which is uh, back to my Danish roots, um, which I think is is just really um, still one of the forerunners of thinking outside of the box about what museums can be. The Louisiana Channel is a, a video channel that's been set up by the Louisiana Museum, but it's not their museum website. And then the videos that are created are long form videos that are really about artists, um, some connected to their collection and others just artists they think um, are important and interesting. And their main philosophy is not to drive people to their website, but to get it distributed out into the world on to others. Anyway, so just a bit of a thought piece at the end. Thank you, Sophie. That's absolutely great. We'll come back to yeah, all of that. Fantastic. Topics. Thank you. And then over to the lovely Nina Colosi. Please go. <laughs> Thank so, you, John. You're welcome. <laughs> so, well, yeah, the, the question um, about hybrid, what is a hybrid museum to me, a hybrid museum, along with its programming within its walls and on its website brings its collection out into the public spaces to reach the general public and those who may never go to a museum. And then the museum tells stories that show how the art of all ages relates to people's lives and to the, the world today and in the future. So um, this is an image of uh, a uh, launch of our program Nordic Outbreak that went to seven continents. And this is Bjork playing throughout Times Square for one month. Yes, and you can go on to the next. And so we've brought art to you know major cities or to an audience of one or, or two or three in Antarctica. And then other projects that have been throughout the world. We've been on seven continents. This is Maurice Benayoun's um, real-time data artwork uh, that takes, uh, that shows what's going on in the world, uh, pulling from about 3000 um, databases on news. And so it sort of takes the pulse of the emotions of the world. Um, then after that slide. 
Apologies, my slide okay. thing is going mental. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, just showing other locations around the world where we have brought exhibitions. You know, we may take one artwork and send it to seven continents or a collection of artwork and send it. So this is, happens to be a virtual reality work. Um, oh yes, that, okay, there, yes. Virtual reality work um, uh, by Lundell and Seidel, a, a Swedish uh, duo. And they connect the world through these artworks. In fact, one of them resides on the Stream Museum website so that you can um, connect with people around the world that you will never meet, but you are connected in real time with them to go through this experience that they have set up. Um, so is there, I think that's the last slide in this. Yeah, well, those are just other locations around the world from Hong Kong to Piazza Duomo in Milan, uh, uh, Bucharest, Romania, Melbourne, Australia, New York City. Just a small Nina, number, yeah. Apologies, because the, the slide moved very quickly in the first and you didn't yeah. even get a chance to introduce yourself. So please just let us know who you are and what you're representing because you've talked to this wonderful project. But... Oh, okay, you mean uh, I'm the founder director of Streaming Museum, mm -hmm. which is a program uh, that brings art to public spaces, cultural centers and its website. And uh, I'm an American woman of Italian descent <laughs> with medium length dark hair and wearing a black blouse and a necklace from India. And I live in the financial district of New York City between the Smithsonian Museum of the American Indian and Wall Street. Thank you. Apologies okay. for uh, making you do that later on, but I'm gonna try and okay. find out what's happening now. I think I have it under control. Thank you, okay. Nina. Come back to you in okay. a mm -hmm. um, Next, Michal. There you go, now it's not moving again. <laughs> oh, no, that's the next one. We could have one. There we go, Michal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So thank you and uh, Ariel for invitation to MCN. It's actually my first time here. So I'm glad to be able to discuss these issues with you. And as, as you said, I'm, I'm working at the Slovak National Gallery uh, based in Bratislava, central of Europe. Um, and uh, I will be uh, giving you a few examples of, of what we do with my colleagues uh, in the gallery. And I have uh, examples which illustrate the take on the hybrid museum. So if we go further in, in the slides, uh, I'll begin by talking about the online collections, which uh, many of you probably also work with in, in museums. And uh, that is not to say that that's some uh, hybrid approach because it's um, most of the time quite um, uh, or not, not quite uh, engaging way of, of, of working with the uh, users online, but uh, it's a good base to work with. And a few, few years ago, uh, we've been asked by uh, the director of uh, our gallery to develop a uh, digital platform on the next slide, uh, which, which will be, uh, which would accompany an exhibition about the uh, uh, history during the Second World War about art and propaganda in Slovakia, which was a dark time uh, when the state was collaborating with the uh, Nazi Germany, and to give uh, enough insight to the visitors of, of the of the gallery, we we created a, a long form uh, storytelling platform on the next slide, which uh, gave the uh, visitors a necessary historical layer uh, using multimedia and. Uh, artworks in the exhibition. And uh, what happened was that this, this hybrid uh, approach worked really well because the uh, uh, visitors were driven to the exhibition, were driven also by, by the uh, site and uh, the other way around the, the visits of the gallery itself were driving the visits of, of, the, of the website. So uh, we were quite encouraged to, to work in this direction. So on the next slide, we were tasked uh, not to create a uh, digital uh, platform or uh, addition to, to an exhibition, but a digital product itself without an exhibition. It was the first time we, we could do something that wasn't based on an exhibition, but it was uh, a, a, a service or product in itself, which proved to be quite uh, challenging. Uh, 
It was about the historical events of 1989 when, when the communist state of Czechoslovakia was uh, falling apart or was dismantled. And uh, we were creating this, so to say, uh, digital pin boards where uh, we were illustrating the historical events by, again, uh, photographs, uh, posters, and so on. But as we wanted to base it still on the on the uh, on, on the platform of, of of the physical or the actual uh, museum, the gallery, we created a, a panel or a board which you can see on the right side, which, which was using some of the items and uh, the website itself on, on a touch screen. So there would be still some a level of interaction at the physical level. And if you go to the next slide, we also created a, uh, a, gallery, a guerrilla campaign uh, with banners that were following the aesthetics of, of the banners that were hanging all over the city at the time of 1989 to drive the uh, attention to the digital level. And uh, all these experiences uh, uh, we'll try to uh, put together in, uh, in the new building, which uh, is shown on the next slide, which is to be opened in, in two years. And it's an, a reconstruction of a, of a late modernist building. And there will be new, new permanent exhibitions and we, we will be working on interactive and immersive uh, uh, concepts for for this using experience we have from this story, storytelling uh, platform and also the online collection. So uh, just last week, we've been on, on the site to see uh, and to imagine how could we <laughs> put uh, the, this additional layer on top of it. And uh, I'm, I'm glad I'll be able to discuss this with you because I don't have definitive answers yet. Thank you. Well, you're always welcome. We, we can try and help in any way we can, Michal. And um, and our final uh, guest, last and not by by no means least, Meret. Uh... Yeah, hello everybody. It's uh, it's really great to be at the MCN again. Albeit I really really miss the vibrant community um, gatherings at the live conferences, but I, I hope that comes back. Um, but in the meantime, thanks for organizing this wonderful virtual coming together of us um, and keeping keeping the conversation alive. Um, I'm sitting in Humlebeck, uh, north of Copenhagen, actually uh, the town of uh, the Louisiana Museum that Sophia referred to. Um, so uh, it's uh, close to uh, the water. I swim in the sea every morning. Um, I'm a white woman. I'm 43, a mother of two, um, and uh, very happy to be here today with you all. Um, when uh, we were asked to, um, to reflect on what this term, the hybrid museum, means to us, I thought that the hybrid museum to me is where digital technologies enable progress in museum practice. It's something we can use to move forward. Um, and the first thing I thought of as an example of that is a really, really amazing piece of writing by Claire Bishop and Nikki Columbus called New MoMA, uh, published uh, in January 2020 in N plus one. Um, you should all go read it. It's a really fantastic eye opener. Um, the article is a, specu a speculative review of what the authors term the New MoMA, um, a complete rethinking of um, the curatorial and educational and organizational structure of the most renowned museum of modern art in the world, uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, and what is amazing about this piece of writing is that um, the thought experiment of um, rethinking what the Museum of Modern Art is and does um, is completely enabled by the fact that the collection of MoMA is available online and that a lot of information that backs up the author's vision of how this collection and representation of the history of modern art, um, how that could be changed 
um, that that thought experiment is made possible by access to the internet, access to data, access to um, online collections. The thought experiment here, if you haven't uh, read it, some of you, is uh, to really embrace um, the insights that we have gotten over the past decades about the inequality in art history, um, the biases in the way that we put together collections and represent what is collected. And what was so amazing to me in this um, thought experiment is that what, what we always know as museum curators is that what we put on display is just a fraction of what we have in our collections, right? So at SMK, where I work, we have a quarter of a million works and we have space for 2,000 works on our walls, mm -hmm. in our galleries. So that's less than 1%. And New MoMA is a thought experiment of um, virtually rehanging the collection with works that are in the collection, mm -hmm. remarkably, but that are not on display now and not in the same constellations. So the whole foundation for a new MoMA is there. And the access to this information for everyone to see is what spurs the new thinking. And I really love the activism of this piece because by describing it as if it happened already, it's activating a kind of, hey, we could do this, this is possible. Um, and it's actually been the driver always for the way we work with, um, uh, you know, <laughs> being a hybrid museum at SMK. Um, the notion that if we digitize and put all of this content out there for everyone to see, art history is going to be rewritten because people will know and see and be able to make their own connections. And this is what New MoMA um, does. And, uh, and I think that's, that's just brilliant, um, a brilliant example of what we hope to see um, happening as a hybrid museum. Thank you, Maret. I think it's, an, an ex it's, you know, the power of the article is, as you said, the, it's an imagining of something that could be, but it's so beautifully done. It really feels like it's actually an existing exhibition you want to go and visit. And it's a very, very different view on what a hybrid museum piece could be. We have just had um, a really good run through and four very different perspectives on what a hybrid experience or a hybrid museum could be. So I've got a couple of questions that I wanna to put to our panelists um, and anyone can jump in and, and answer them. Um, my first one is, how do the various strategies for you guys, both within institutions and then working on within institutions that actually have no physical boundaries, how do these adoptions of these new sort of hybrid modes of thinking um, move, move the conversation forward around the collections that they have that are there? Any one of you can jump in. <laughs> I mean, I can jump in, um, you know, as a, as a museum that has, you know, a, a huge collection and, and as Mireille says, you know, has really worked to get a huge amount online and, um, and made it accessible through the open, open access program. I would say that um, adopting that sort of hybrid mentality by going to open access and by developing an API to get the content out there ha has really meant that we continue to have very robust conversations about what kind of data should be out in the world about the collection. Um, we look at other data sets and think about what ours should look like in, in a way that I, I sort of, I don't think would have happened if the open access kind of idea hadn't been, um, you know, put out there and, and fought, you know, that the institution fought so hard to get out there. Um, and so I think that really there's sort of some new pathways that open up because of that, you know, new pathways into our collection that um, our partners using our API are asking us, they, you know, asking us questions that we wouldn't, you know, we do a lot of co collaborations with um, universities like the Pratt um, and, you know, the student bodies there ask 
us and push us in terms of how we're going to put our data out and the kind of stories that we that we would be telling and they have very different stories to tell than than the museum does and i think that's that's part of the opportunity and i think Mareida's example really does it in the hypothetical but i think we we're already seeing that those conversations lead to questions and 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 points of um discovery within our own organization um so i think from that perspective it's really about opening up new pathways to thinking about the collection um, right. and, and decentralizing authority right like we may have the expertise on the particular work of art but we are part of a conversation with others about its meaning absolutely can i weigh in on that please i was just thinking one of the conversations that keeps coming up uh, when we work with uh, our open data and and uh, just like at the met um we we put our collection in the public domain um and um and we use also one another thing about the hybrid museum is that we also use hybrid intelligence to um, uh, to uh, to reach um, a, a place where um, people can actually search our data. Um, it takes a lot to actually um, make the data accessible to others than experts. Um, for us, we needed to uh, use machine learning to add keywords to our collection because we never had the resources to do that. Um, mm -hmm. That entails lots of biases that we can <laughs> then discuss. Um, but what I wanted to say is that uh, the interesting challenge uh, as a museum in a hybrid environment is that once you um, open up your data, you also open up all the flaws and errors in your data, <laughs> um, which is, um, you know, it makes you, uh, your hands shake a little as, uh, you know, uh, trained academics uh, that are used to um, being in perfect control of what you publish and put into the world. But the conversations and the feedback um, and the learnings from the public that entails is incredibly valuable in terms of being a hybrid museum, I think. Thank you, Mary. Oh, feedback. Um, to feed on that thought then, because obviously we're in a stage now where everything is post-digital. We've all we're all digital now. The, the transformation that we've all undergone over the last 18 months has been really intense. And we're now in a world where are we now in a world where hybrid becomes a genuine part of the strategy and has to become part of the strategy for museums? Or is it just something that we think will potentially sway back to a more traditional approach to you know, visitor engagement once people start arriving at the you know, brick and mortar institutions again? What are your feelings on those? I don't think it will ever go back. <laughs> It will just keep expanding and new um, types of programs will be developed that we're unaware of right now. You know, once the artists get into their creative mode and think about how to make other types of digital programs that people can engage with um, and how they can express what's going on in the world too through, through these programs. There's a lot that can be done. It feels like we're entering a new, an entirely new phase of um, museum curatorial practice, right? Um, and just in a, moving that forward again, um, how are people seeing, you know, the adoptions of a sort of uh, mobile hybrid sentimentality feed into the larger strategies of their institutions? How are these? How have the how's the pivot to digital now fueling other elements of the institutional um, structure? Oh. Hello. Jump in, uh, jump in, yeah, and maybe okay. maybe uh, answer the also the question before. Uh, yes. I, I was talking to my colleagues who are at the at the same. Uh, level of the building where, where the current uh, exhibitions are, and they said that they've uh, seen really many uh, new people coming in, young people, uh, for the recent exhibition, which was uh, launched uh, during the lockdown, and it was uh, 
started with a, a live streaming and uh, with digital content uh, before it was open to public after one uh, month. So the, the hypothesis is that it, it, it helped actually the, the number of visits when, when it opened uh, uh, for a physical visit. So if you maybe uh, start now and start digital to, to tease the, 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 the exhibition or your activities and only then launch the, the actual physical experience, you might gain uh, some new, new, uh, new visitors. So, but maybe, maybe that's a question, uh, answer to the question before, not, not the current one. I'd, I'd like to say something I mean, about, go on. Uh, if I may, Giles. Please, please. <laughs> I just couldn't find my unmute button to, to agree with you. <laughs> okay. um, about how, how this, um, uh, the digital or the hybrid is, is, uh, is affecting strategy. Yes. Um, yes. Or, or how it's feeding into um, the overall strategy at least as a national gallery, as a public mm -hmm. service institution, um, tax funded uh, very much with a, a public mission. Um, the, the notion of uh, providing, you know, uh, raw materials for democratic citizenship is, is very high when it comes to, um, you know, opening up the digital gateways here. Um, not only uh, you know the the online collection as uh, as a resource, but also opening up the mind of the museum of the staff to interact with uh, the surrounding world um, and becoming a platform for uh, the debates and the uh, creative. Um, actions and uh, communities that people want us to be. Um, in that way, I really agree with what you say, Nina. There's no going back from here um, <clears throat> because um, when we use digital in, um, in a sustainable way, there are many dark sides of digital. But when we find the ethically sound and the sustainable ways of integrating it into museum practice. Mm -hmm. uh, it really supports the initial idea of museums of being platforms or places for yeah. Uh, yeah. literacy, for right. enlightenment, uh, yes. for yes. communities. For, for being a muse. I mean, a museum yes. is a muse. So, exactly. And that doesn't mean just for people who are going into museums and paying the fee. This is for everyone in the world. Mm -hmm. The arts have such power to, you know, bring about uh, change in the world and, and make the world a better place. So telling the stories that are within the art collections and relating them to people's lives and to the world and to the future. This has such a profound power that needs to be tapped much further. Bring it out to the, the general public who don't go to museums. They need it more than the people who do. Yeah, I would just add, more. Oh, go on, Sophie. I was just going to say, just to add to that, that I think, you know, you know, even a place like the Met, which has had such a robust investment in digital for a long time, I think even our internal constituents were, I think, surprised by how important our pivot to kind of an online only museum was during the shutdown of the mm -hmm. pandemic. I think it really did. I saw a, a note um, from our colleagues at the Rice Museum in the chat about it speeding up um, kind of conversations. And I, I do think that reality check of this is not just a nice to have, right? This is not something that is just a kind of, um, you know, a, a, a good, activity that one ought to be doing. It's like, it's really essential, right? It's gone from being, you know, sort of a, not the side hustle. It really has to be an essential part of museum practice. And, um, you know, I think Mireille is talking about it, you know, really eloquently in terms of how it, how it shapes curatorial thinking in it. And I think, you know, Nina, your, your perspective on kind of how it engages our public, I think that's really such a such a, a lesson that we've seen with the pandemic. I mean, you know, as I said, the Met has huge 
um, collections online, but we our ability to actually pivot during shutdown and point to really meaningful content meant right. that you know our our website you know it website traffic increased. You know it was the contrary of what happened in a lot of other organizations that didn't have some of the evergreen content that collections based content can really help. Um, you know, feed into. So I think, you know, as much as I am a champion of, of not thinking about the museum website as, uh, you know, the, the, the measure of success for the hybrid museum idea, I think it does teach us that people needed these resources and they will continue to need them, right? Online education is only going to grow from here. Um, and so I think that's that's a really important um, kind of alignment for our, for our sector to be thinking about. Yeah. Thank you, Sophie. And um, to finish from that wonderful thought, and I completely wholeheartedly agree with the last three points. Um, again, I thought this might happen. We have a conversation that I wish could last an hour and a half or two, but we are coming right up against the clock. So in the last three or four minutes, I just want to open this out to the floor to see if there is anyone out there who has a specific question they'd like to present to the panel now. So far, no. No questions. questions. If anyone now is your now is your <laughs> your chance. If you've got a question that you'd like to ask, I mean, I if we wait, well, while we're waiting for that one, I just would like to ask one because I know this is something that we're all struggling with: is the notion of evaluation of a hybrid museum. I don't know if anyone has come across or is or can share the sort of metrics they're looking at. And Sophie, you just talked to a point that slightly by saying that you know maybe the website isn't the metric, but are you guys? looking at something or how are you broadly looking at it without giving away all your secrets yeah no and i would gladly share all all of our um, <laughs> all of our secrets i mean you know we are really working on evaluation frameworks all the time and actually i see elena yeah. is on this call and she's really the expert in this field on on helping us to do that you know but i would say i think it's if your goal is to share knowledge and to be an institution of you know an encyclopedic institution like the met then the roi isn't just about you know how many sessions and did somebody click on your thing right it, it should really be about who you are reaching so mm -hmm. you know i think that's where that distributed museum idea is so important to me because it's it's not just about did everybody make it here but can we be you know we have we're reaching over 250 million people on wikipedia because of our integration of the Mets collection on Wikipedia. That to me is just as important a metric, it may be more important metric than if somebody yeah. you know, engages with an article on our, on our website. Um, so I think the who you're trying to reach is so, so important. And, and then what happens to them, right? Did they have, what kind of experience did they have? Was it a learning experience? Was it um, something that surprised them? Was it something that was fun, right? And, and understanding motivation as part of your metric for success rather than just the pure numbers thank you sophie anyone well, else yeah, no, I, you... I, yeah. Oh, please Nina, <laughs> Nina, go, go ahead i will go. say that one way that i can measure how many people are experiencing the work is if you look at the actual pictures uh in the slides that i have where you see hmm. hund hundreds of thousands of people have seen it has registered in their subconscious whether they're you know spending two seconds looking at it or um even um, like Piazza Duomo in Milan, you know, wow. every weekend there, there were like, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of people, the top picture up there uh, would go through the, you know, and Times Square, one artwork throughout one month gets uh, um, 560,000 wow. people within that area at that point in time yeah. over the course of a month. Thank you. And guys, I'm really sorry to have to do this, but we are <laughs> literally out of time. However, I encourage you to run, scream, chase to the next session, which is going to be led by the wonderful Toril Haugen uh, on a specific hybrid museum experience. Um, that session will be starting in 15 minutes. And just before we go, also, if you're more interested in finding out some of the more of the work of the Streaming Museum, and a wonderful publication um, produced by Nina uh, in conjunction with the UN. There's on the streamingmuseum.org, you can uh, download and read a, a wonderful piece uh, which looks at the work of the UN. Well, Nina, quickly, you describe it. <laughs> um, do you have a picture of it there? Um, actually, no, I'm afraid not. Center point now. Here, I have it right here. If you can see it, center point now, we produce this for the 75th anniversary. 
of the United Nations. So it is putting together art and the different um, goals of the UN and the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So art plays a very important role in the publication. So you can, down, yeah, you can download it 160 pages. You can read it online on the website. Thank you, Nina. And thank you everyone thank you. for taking part. It's been a really fascinating conversation and we'll see as many of you in the next channel, uh, chat as possible. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.